So hi everyone and welcome to the on-site conversion panel. I'm Rachel Tyers, SVP of Partnerships and Marketing at Okendo, and I'm thrilled to be joined by industry experts Lindsay Kalinsky from Okendo, Swad Sate from Sezzle, we have Wes Buckwalter from Sea Monster Studios, Colleen Schneider from Search Spring, and Steph Carcamo from Just You Know. So a little bit of housekeeping, drop any questions that you have in the chat. Remember to put those out to everyone, not just the hosts and panelists, and we will be able to answer anything in the chat during the panel. We'll also be sending out a video recording tomorrow. So to get started, I'd love for each of our experts to tell the audience a bit about yourself and your company. So Lindsay, let's start with you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I am Lindsay Kalinske. I am the Senior Marketing Lead here at Okendo. Um, Okendo is a customer marketing platform that helps Shopify brands drive revenue uh, through reviews and surveys. Um, and we work with brands like Skims, Netflix, Soylent, some of the you know fastest growing D2C brands. So excited to have you guys all here today. And in terms of myself, um, I've been in e-commerce for over five years um, on marketing, partner marketing, and customer success. So really excited to talk with everyone on this topic today. Thanks, Linz. Swad. Hello, everyone. My name is Swad. I'm on the partnerships team here at Sezzel. I've been with the company for over four years now. Sezzel is a buy now, pay later solution that enables your shoppers to split their online purchases into installments, um, which leads to higher AOVs, um, higher uh, conversion rates, and a decrease in cart abandonment. Um, we work with over 45,000 merchants in the US and Canada, and we are also a mission-driven company. We are a certified B Corp. So yeah, super excited to be here and um, uh, to be a part of this panel. Thank you. Thanks, Wood. Great to have you. Wes? I'm Wes Buckwalter, the CEO and Creative Director of Sea Monster Studios. Uh, we're a full service agency based in Seattle, Washington, but we work with folks all across the globe. Uh, we deal with everything from brand design and strategy to e-commerce strategy, uh, web design and development of all kinds, web applications. And um, we tend to pitch ourselves as a data-driven agency. I love uh, analytics and using data to our advantage to help drive our customers to uh, do what we want them to do. Thanks, Wes. Colleen, over to you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Colleen Schneider. I am a customer success team lead here at SearchSpring. Been with the company for about three years. Um, I have a beautiful two-year-old. I love my squishy face bulldog. Just a little bit about me. Um, and SearchSpring itself is a site search relevancy and merchandising platform. We also have an entire personalized personalization suite of services. And really, our main goal is working with e-commerce businesses of all sizes, um, helping to drive the ultimate shopper experience. And the reason we're all here today, increase conversions at the end of the day. Great. Thank you, Colleen. And yeah. last but not least, Steph. Hi, everyone. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am based out of Austin, and I'm from Just Juno, and I work with the customer success strategist over here. And our main goal is to help clients or anyone really looking at their website and understand how we can help through pop-ups, through specific messaging, get someone to the next step. And ideally that's to convert, right? But sometimes it is just to engage with your brand and lead into any of these other steps, whether it's leading a review, leaving a review or just like continuing your research on site. So we really help map out that whole on-site experience and an effort for you to make a, an impact on that whole visitor experience. All right. Thank you. So Steph, why are we here today? Why do we have to work so hard to convert customers? I think, yeah, I mean, we're here to learn how we can, right? And kind of to learn not what to, what to not do. And I think right now we have to work so hard and should want to because working hard to convert customers is what helps you establish that whole long-term on-site relationship with them that feeds into all of your other channels. So ideally, if you're working hard to convert, then you're hitting those steps of communicating with them in your brand voice and getting your creative across so that is it is engaging. Right. So what, what would you add there? Um, I mean, I, I guess like the fact of the matter is that the, 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 the market is super tight at the moment. Shoppers have more options than ever. 
So what are you guys as merchants doing to ensure that a shopper not only visits your site, but converts and then maybe taking us taking it a step forward, what are you doing to ensure that they come back and can continue to convert? So um, I guess, you know, with increasing uh, customer acquisition costs, like you need to be really mindful about, about the way you're spending your dollars and leveraging different tools out there um, to ensure that, again, customers are not only visiting your site, but also converting and hopefully they continue to convert. Right, yeah, couldn't agree more. Wes, what do you think? Yeah, I think to build on what Swad said, we're seeing an increased cost of acquisition. It's it's sort of going through the roof. And I think with the saturation of competition in the marketplace, we're spending a lot of dollars to bring our customers in for the first time or maybe for the second time, uh, but not necessarily always focusing on how we're utilizing those dollars to drive into a conversion, right? So we can pay for the cost of acquisition with purchases. And so I think it's becoming ever increasingly more important to make sure that the dollars that you are spending are well utilized uh, and then they're not wasted on a customer who bounces right away from the site once you've got them there and maintain their attention for a moment. Very true. Now, Lindsay, in terms of actually implementing best practices for conversion, what's your number one tip for converting customers? Yeah, so I would definitely say having social proof and then not only having social proof, but making sure you're maximizing it, you know, the impact and we're using it across your entire, you know, website. So, you know, social proof from reviews, it helps build up trust and mitigate any concerns that a customer could have about your product or your brand. So really creating that like authenticity and that experience that, you know, isn't the polished photo, you know, that your, your marketing team and your design teams are coming up with, but really helping to reinforce that real customers are using this product um, and that, you know, they're having a good or potentially negative experience with it and letting other customers make decisions based on that. Um, so it's really important to make sure that when you're thinking about, you know, reviews and social proof, what's that information that you need to get from existing customers to help new customers convert. So things like showcasing with photos and videos, um, asking for customer attributes, which could be, you know, demographic, behavioral preferences, things that are, you know, what the specific reviewer was. So you can, you know, relate to that um, with them. Things like product attributes. So, you know, fit quality, if you're a makeup brand and you're, you know, for a highlighter, how, what was the shine factor? You know, is it the top shiny or at least so about the product itself um, and really making sure you're giving new customers as much information as possible so that they can make an educated decision on whether or not this product is right for them. So it's really going to help on the conversion side. Also will most likely help on the return side as well, if you're really helping them to, to make that decision um, for what's right with them. Um, on top of just having a review though on your PDP page or the product details page, you know, making sure you're also utilizing that social proof through out the entire website journey. So on um, your homepage, you can have a carousel of all the pictures from reviews that are getting more authentic, the selfie, you know, all those things that show like real customers are using this, putting the star ratings on your category pages or as, you know, throughout checkout, really just enforcing and reinforcing that social proof throughout the entire customer journey on your website is really going to help you maximize those conversion and, and, um, help make sure that that you're getting the customer the right product for them. For sure. Now, Colleen, what are your tips here? I think you're on mute, Colleen. Rookie mistake. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so really taking a step back and holistically looking at what is your merchandising strategy? What drives your, sh your shoppers to buy, right? And moving those products to the top of the page, kind of employing a universal set of business rules and logic. I mean, this can be as simple as I want to showcase my in-stock products and my best-selling items at the top of the result set. So when somebody performs a search or they go to a category listing page, they're actually seeing those products that they can have and that are heavy hitters on your site that you know drive a lot of revenue. So it can be as simple as that and letting that just ride. Um, a lot of people's e-commerce sites are heavy promotional driven. And so does that change every two weeks? Does that change every month? Does that change you know, every quarter? What are we trying to achieve with our 
own um, promotional model and merchandising strategy and then applying that from a global perspective, right? To make sure that that aligns with what the shoppers are looking for because that is the key right there to um, helping them find the products that they're looking for quicker and therefore converting quicker. Great tip. Thanks, Colleen. So I, yeah. What you add? yeah, so speaking from the Sezzle um, standpoint, I guess one big um, conversion tip is to leverage uh, the various alternate payment solutions out there. You know, these different types of solutions are starting to become a go-to for millions of consumers out there. And especially for the younger generation, you know, a younger generation that has been typically underserved, shoppers that are deserving a credit, but haven't had the chance to build that so far. So even in my own example, I don't want to go on too much of a tangent here, but like I only got a credit card after I graduated from college when I was 21. So that whole time, when I wanted to buy things, I had to use a debit card and I wasn't building credit. So when you're offering these alternative payment solutions, you're offering them credit in a responsible way. And now that can directly have an impact when it comes to conversions. Shoppers, for instance, in, you know, in, a, in a buy now pay later solution that is four payments over the course of six weeks, then when shoppers are, when shoppers are paid themselves every two weeks, then they feel a lot more comfortable, you know, like making that type of purchase. So, you know, offering the different options out there. And then I guess even more importantly, informing your consumers that, you know, that's so, that such solutions are available available to them. And that can be done through um, widgets underneath your uh, product display pages, um, website marketing, and leveraging your buy now, pay later solutions tools, such as email and social media marketing. So um, again, not only using the solution, but also informing your shoppers that the solution is available to them. Good point. And Steph, what's your perspective? Yeah, when it comes to conversion, I think everything that everyone's mentioned so far can be applied to a pop-up, which I know sometimes we think of that as like something that is intruding. But when we're thinking about pop-ups, it is definitely meant to be more personalized or it, us anticipating what that next action would be. So for example, when someone is coming from social media, right, we may have a different welcome offer or just general welcome message versus someone that is returning as a return customer. And maybe that's where we highlight SWAD Sezzle and that, hey, we now have this option if you're introducing it or reminding them and kind of building that relationship as far as like how the customer interacts and exchange money, exchanges money with you. I think that can be seen as a development of that relationship with a visitor or a customer more that like along with the channels of email and SMS, you know, we're trying to build the relationship, but like money and, and exchanging that I think is like a pretty solid way of showing. And if they're using other tools that you have like Sezzle, or if you are able to promote like your reviews and Sezzle in a combo way, like that's how you can use both of those powerhouse apps in a pop-up to target someone that's exiting or someone that's visiting and they've been to your site like 10 times and they just haven't made a purchase. Maybe that's a little extreme, but I know I visit a site many times when I'm researching, like, did I read that right? What did it say? Like, I'll take screenshots all day, but I will keep this in my site. So that's where like that unique targeting and kind of knowing how your visitors are behaving and getting down to that data can really help drive the conversion. And it may feel like a lot, but I find that if you break it down in those segments or of course, where you're investing a lot, that can be a, a good way to start. Yeah. And Wes, what are your tips? Well, I think uh, using data and analytics to your advantage uh, kind of brings all of this stuff back to uh, reality, right? So you've, you've got your reviews going, you've acquired a customer, they've taken a journey. Um, and what we need to do is measure what they did and why they did it. And the nice thing about most human beings is we all sort of behave the same, but each of us has unique nuances when it comes to the way we research products or the way that we behave once we've left a review or once we've become a loyal customer. And so if we have an opportunity to set sort of realistic goals or in the beginning, make some great assumptions and tie all of the data from all of our tech stack together, we can start to measure things that we've decided to put in play. When we've popped an exit pop-up and asked somebody to leave us a review, we can prove that that does something for us or that we should be spending our efforts somewhere else if needed. Um, and so any opportunity we can take to let sort of unbiased data guide our decision-making process. It makes our efforts a little bit lighter. Uh, it proves that our concepts and assumptions are working or not working and need to be revisited. Um, it gives us really an opportunity to sort of 
polish our systems in a way that lets us get to a behavioral method that, that we need from our customers and find really the most valuable customers that we can recognize within our pool of audience to sort of either you know exploit in a specific way, guide down a product choice, personalize in a certain way, um, you know, and, and really just sort of prove the concept of we want to put the least amount of barriers between ourselves and somebody's wallet. And so are we doing the right thing? Are we making the best decisions? And should we change our decisions based on what our, our data is showing us? With taking the other side of the coin, what are some things that brands are doing that are actually negatively impacting their conversion rates? Well, I think it can be a myriad of things. It could be, you know, a bad visual experience on the site, confusing language, uh, you know, not accounting for all visitor types, you know, whether it's folks with disabilities or folks who speak a different language or folks who don't understand your products very well. Maybe you're a startup with a brand new, really novel idea, and you've got a product that is somewhat unknown to the audience. Just making sure that folks have the right amount of information at their fingertips while still recognizing that we all have very short attention spans. And so making minute and consumable data is really important. So bullet points are always better than five paragraphs if we can achieve that. Um, but I think it all starts with build the experience that you want to experience and hope that um, that's a great starting point. And then, you know, continuously adjust. I think a lot of merchants take, take the idea of if we build it, they will come, maybe acquire some customers and see some success, but never evolve beyond that initial step for a while. Um, and I think a website is a living, breathing organism. It needs to be evolved daily or weekly in a way that responds to your audience and the behaviors that, that you're seeing from them. Yeah, for sure. And Colleen, what have you seen negatively impacting conversion rates? You're on mute again. I'm sorry, guys. I'll do better. Um, yeah, so a lot of times I'll see that folks have manually curated an experience on the page and like have pinned certain products at the top that are no longer resonating. Maybe they've gone out of stock or um, you know, now they're on sale and they've got this sale product showcased at the top of the page, just because it's on sale doesn't mean somebody's looking for it. Right. Um, and so really not understanding, not looking at the metrics, not understanding, Hey, people are searching for this a lot, but the conversion rate has dropped and then taking that into account, knowing, okay, this is a great search query or great page to target. Um, in terms of merchandising, I need to go and look and see what has been set up on this page and make sure that it's still resonating with the shoppers. Um, just always making sure that the products that are most resonant with the shoppers are at the top of the page there. Um, yeah. Great. And Steph, what are some mistakes that you see? The mistakes I see related to conversion are really more of just driving someone through many channels to try to engage with you, which is easy to do because I think a common common data points, right? We want email, we want phone numbers, first name, birthdays, things like that. But sometimes we're taking them through too many, like we're taking them through an email welcome flow and an SMS welcome flow. So timing that out properly can really help with your conversion down the line which I know is just kind of like long-term thinking or more like bigger thinking when in that moment, you're like, I want to engage with them. I want them to like engage with me and see me in all these channels. So trying to take them through too many experiences and on site, that's really more literal. We have at just, you know, kind of these foundational pop-ups that we like to implement, which would be a welcome offer, an exit offer, exit intent pop-up and something that targets someone abandoning their cart as they're on site. So in those different experiences, if someone is already engaging with your welcome offer and you're giving them 15% there and you're sending the email immediately, and maybe they're also getting SMS and they happen to see a cart abandoner that's a, a different offer, maybe meant for a different audience at that point, that can be confusing. And maybe at that point, they're left comparing too many offers or looking into your brand and kind of overthinking it. So that's where like, if they've already engaged with the lead capture in that moment, we can target that experience and know that they are going through that flow as a new visitor, new to our brand versus someone that has maybe been to the site a couple of times and is our, our ideal person to trigger a cart abandoner because we don't want to trigger it too soon. I get that a lot of like, we don't want to trigger it too soon. And I understand that because that conflicts with like conversion rates and like what we're giving up at the end of the day. So I would say keeping them in one flow is ideal, but 
if you try to get them in too many flows in those first um, those first experiences with your brand, then that can be kind of tricky. Got it. And Spot, any insight from Sezzle's side? Yeah, for sure. I mean, kind of going back to what Colleen said about, um, you know, if, if if a shopper's on your store and they can't find what they're looking for, obviously, then they're not going to convert. Similarly, I think it works with payment options as well. If you don't give your shoppers the option that they want or like their preferred option, they're just not going to check out. I kind of like to equate it with credit cards. So now you don't just offer Visa, right? You have to offer MasterCard and Discover and Amex. So because each network is bringing in, you know, their own subset of users, you know, even at restaurants, like, you know, in the past, like, you know, I've tried checking out at a restaurant and they're like, oh, wait, I don't, we don't accept Amex. And I'm like, well, you know, what the hell? So, you know, I think similarly, I think you have to like start to consider buy now, pay later in the same way. Consumers are always going to have, or they're always going to want the power to, you know, take charge over, you know, their decision making and, you know, their, their uh, payment options. That's something that's never going to change, but the, but the format that they're using, but the, but the product that they're using, that's something that's always going to change. So offering younger consumers the different buy now, pay later options out there can definitely make um, a huge difference. Um, so yeah, I'd say like the, that's like the big 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 conversion point you just have to give them the options because if you don't give them the options well they have no choice but to not check out with you yeah exactly and how about you Lindsay what have you seen negatively impacting conversion yeah so I would say well one obviously not having reviews and social proof at all um but two only showing your five star reviews so consumers are really smart um they know someone's gonna have a negative experience whether it's valid or you know maybe it was a review about the shipping experience and not really the product but they're smart they know that not everyone is going to give five stars so um we hear a lot of brands that are really scared about hey I don't want to collect reviews because I don't want to showcase the negative ones. And actually conversion is at highest when your average star rating is between 4.2 and 4.5. And that's because, you know, having that again, showcasing the bad experiences along with the good shows that you're actually reputable. You know, you're not just, you know, scamming them or only showing them what they want to see. It really helps build that trust with customers. Um, and also publicly responding to those negative reviews is really important because again, if, if there is a concern and a new customer is seeing, hey, but you know, their customer service team was on it, they helped resolve it. And again, they're not afraid to show cases. It really helps again, mitigate any of those doubts that if they were to have, you know, a bad experience being new to your brand that like, you'll resolve it and they can trust you. Um, so that's something that is definitely really important. Another thing, not just related to reviews in general, um, but something to consider is site speed. Um, so overall, if your page takes longer than four seconds to load, over 60% of shoppers bounce and reducing your page load by 0.1 second can increase revenue by 2%. So if you're not thinking about site speed, especially as you're thinking about, you know, all the apps that we're talking about here today, you know, something like a reviews widget, you know, with photos, UGC, videos, testimonials, Q&A, all of that could potentially have a high impact and, you know, slow down your site speed. Um, so something to be thinking about, we're proud at Okendo. Um, we have been recognized by Yoda in their annual site speed report um, to be little to no impact on site speed. So we have built our app that way, but it's definitely something to consider with reviews, with all the other apps, you know, making sure you're not doing too much and slowing down that site speed because that is definitely a conversion killer. That's a very good tip. And I think we can all relate as consumers as well. If the site's taking too long to load, you're bouncing. So we've talked about how to improve your conversion rate and how to make sure you're not hurting it. But Colleen, knowing the impact that merchandising can have on conversion, how much of a brand's time should be spent reflecting and implementing a targeted merchandising strategy? Yeah. And, I, you know, it's an interesting question, right? And I think it's multifaceted. Um, it's not just one thing. I've talked a lot about product ordering and being able to easily in, employ or a method for just kind of plug and play. Let's put some like logic on the page and have the products reordered as it reflects to your own merchandising strategy. But it's also about, you know, 
using badging and letting us know which products are on sale or which products are new. Um, it's about, um, you know, using banners. A lot of times those can be in grid so that you're targeting certain types of buyers uh, or shoppers on the site. Are they a bargain hunter? Are they the infinite scroller? Are they brand new to your site and looking for your best sellers or are they returning customer and looking for um, you, you know, your newest products and creating different transaction funnels throughout the site. So I would say, um, you know, this can be utilized in a lot of different ways. So it's not just, you know, this amount of time being spent on product ordering, which that shouldn't take up all of your time, right? It should be isolating. Like these are our strategies and let me use a platform that helps me streamline this. So I'm not spending all of my time doing this so that you can start to layer there. What kind of badges do I want? What kind of banners do I want? How can I use personalization on the page, right? So that as a shopper interacts with my site, this is something that's automated. Products start to reorder based on that interaction. It's not about how much more time do I have to spend, but how smarter, how much smarter can I be with my time? And what am I using, again, to help shoppers like resonate with the products on my site? Um, so yeah, thanks for that question. That's Definitely a really good tip. How can we be smarter? Because we know that merchants are always- We don't have the time. No. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's, a, they often wear multiple hats, right? Yes. So where can I target my energy to make sure that I'm getting the biggest return? Um, a lot of that also is using reporting, taking a look at your zero results report. If I tell my, my folks that I work with, it's like, hey, if you have no time, focus on the zero a results report and target those searches that today are yielding zero products on the page because just by pointing them toward product where they didn't have the opportunity to convert before now they absolutely do and it can be as easy as redirecting them to a specific url or um Maybe they're searching for subscription and now you've got them to your sign up page. Or maybe it's I don't carry this, but it's coming back soon. So let me let them know that with some banner content. Hey, we're out, check back on X day and see these similar products in the meantime that hopefully resonate with at least one of them, right? To capture at least one shopper on the site, um, increasing dollars uh, in, in kind of that scenario as well. So lots of opportunity comes around looking at the reporting, looking at the insights, making sure we understand what exactly are people searching for and what are they not finding today? So lots of different different strategies there. Definitely. And so giving customers options is important. And what are some of your suggestions for optimizing a buy now, pay later solution and increasing customer participation? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like getting the solution integrated is the first step. So now that you've now that you're now that you've done that, now what are you doing to promote it? So the first step is being accurate and targeted in the way you do so. So again, as I mentioned previously, leveraging your buy now, pay later solutions, marketing assets. So whether that is a widget under the product page. So the widget can say, this is a hundred dollar item, or you could split this into four interest prepayments of $25. That messaging can immediately, you know, uh, you know, create interest in the in the in the customer's eyes also using uh the solutions uh marketing assets in the form of email marketing or social media marketing to ensure that they are not only you know converting you know existing merchants but are also sending net new merchants to you now the second idea is maybe using integrations and templates so for instance let's say you are sending out cart abandonment emails maybe start adding, you know, buy now, pay later messaging in that being like, hey, I see that you abandoned cart. Did you know that you could actually split that purchase into interest-free installments? So I think that's like, you know, being a bit creative with it is a good idea. When it comes to Sezzle specifically, we have a template with Justuno, for instance. So let's say a shopper is um, on the checkout uh page for like a, a, a few seconds too many, then they'll see a pop-up that says, hey, did you know that you can actually check out using a buy now, pay later solution? So I think leveraging these handy tools is something that you should educate yourself with. And then lastly, um, 
in, in when I answered the previous question about like offering different types of solutions, like and offering different types of network providers. So you have to offer Visa and MasterCard and Discover and Amex. You might have to like start thinking about that the same way with buy now, pay later. You might want to leverage more than one solution and identify solutions that work best with your user demographic, your AOV, your vertical, um, your geographic location, and so on. Because not every solution is built the same, and each solution is bringing in their own subset of user. So identifying the right solution for your own website is something that you definitely should look into. That's interesting. Are there any particular audiences and demographics that Sezzle resonates with in your experience, Swood? Yeah, for sure. I mean, typically, um, someone someone would immediately think like it is, you know, younger consumers and focusing on verticals such as fashion and beauty. Yes, that is that is like the staple that we work that we work with. But we also work with verticals such as CBD electronics, shooting sports. So like there's like tons of different verticals out there that we specifically focus on. So there's not like one user demographic that we're looking at. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of our solution. We're super flexible. But again, I, I really, and I love for all merchants to work with us, but I would really recommend doing your own research and then identifying a solution that fits best for you. Sure. Thank you. And Steph, what types of experiences can you build on site to drive conversions? Yeah, I think Swad hit a great one with the template that we have with Sezzle, where you can just build a, a an experience that's targeting that demographic that you know kind of browses a certain way, or if someone has added a certain item to cart, you can target that, that, them that way with that Sezzle information and kind of give them maybe a more detailed breakdown of what they can expect. And that's where you can educate too, if someone's leaving or just on that browsing intent, kind of trying to be their buddy as they're shopping. And as far as experiences, I know I've touched on like the channel or the source that someone's coming from, but you can also build an experience on site based on your influencer that you're working with, based on your staff internally and kind of what, what they're giving you as ammo to use on site. Or maybe it's like Lindsay's saying, all that UGC, user-generated content in the form of reviews or just some fun pictures that your staff is putting together. Um, return customers. I know that Colleen hit on that. And she like hit it all perfectly. So I will just say like ditto on that. Return customers and all those different segments like that relate to merchandising. You can create those different experiences through pop-ups that is really meant to anticipate what their next action should be or where you see other visitors going on site. And then another one would be for as far as experiences, building off of what data you don't have. So an experience for those that have purchased but have not yet subscribed or the other way around, subscribe but not yet purchased. So different, maybe they need a little bit more, more um, user-generated content or maybe it's a discount that's going to do the trick. I, I saw someone mention like, what if we're not really doing a lot of discounts or offers like that? Then for you, it can be more about providing those educational pieces or downloadables um, something that is engaging with your brand can be where you take that if you're not really wanting to do a, a sort of discount or offer there. And Zach has mentioned in the chat about A-B testing, but I think that's probably something oh, that's yeah. relevant here as well, right? You got it, Zach, yeah. Absolutely. And let's see, we spoke about social proof and negative reviews, but what makes a high quality review that will actually maximize the impact on conversion? Yeah, so we kind of like to distinguish, as you mentioned, from like a negative review versus a bad review. So a negative review is kind of more of like three stars and below, right? Like I wasn't happy with the product, whereas a bad review is really related to like the quality of the review itself. So if my review is just a text testimonial that says, great product, you know, that's not going to help new buyers and give them any information that they had to convert and feel any better about the product. Like, who is it coming from? Like, why was it great? Um, so having that high quality review and making sure again, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, having all of that information that you need from past buyers to help new buyers convert. Um, so the more that you can add to that review things, again, photos and videos, the actual, you know, star rating and, you know, copy and testimonial itself, but things like those product attributes that I mentioned, the customer attributes are really going to help new buyers 
find buyers just like them. Um, I think I saw someone say something about like paying for reviews. You can also verify that these are like real reviews and you know where the customer came from. So there's a lot you can do there to make sure that these are authentic. Um, but you know, again, in terms of like that high quality and the impact, you know, say I'm in in the search for like a new moisturizer and I'm on a skincare brand's website. I'm trying to figure out which one is right for me. I'm between a few different products. I'm really not sure. You know, I can filter reviews based on what I'm looking for. So maybe, you know, again, I have dry skin, but I'm looking at a review that's three stars um, and that person has oily skin. And then I'm looking at the product attribute and they're saying, hey, it's too thick for them. But then I find someone who has dry skin like me and is in my age range and you know, I'm looking and they say the thickness is just right of the moisturizer. They say it's really helped their dry skin and they love it. I look at their photo or their video of them, you know, doing their skincare routine <laughs> and saying like, they look great. This is awesome. They're just like me. Um, so really like the more information, again, just to really harp on that point that you can include in those reviews, it's just going to help those buyers that have never tried your product before, especially when you're online, you can't test it. I can't see what it looks like. I can't feel it. The only thing I can go by really is what other people are saying to make the best decision for me. Um, so ultimately, you know, that's kind of what we consider to be a high quality, high impact review. That's really going to drive that conversion sales. And like I mentioned before, reduce the likelihood of returns because you help drive them to the right product. Yes. Very good point there. And Wes, what's your recommendation for brands choosing apps that optimize conversion and which ones are right for that specific brand? Well, I mean, I think to put it in really simple terms, everything that we're talking about here today is customer satisfaction, right? A satisfying journey, a satisfying experience after they've been acquired, a satisfying search methodology, a satisfying way to research a product or pay for a product, um, understand the product and feel as though let's say the website is speaking to them from a personalization standpoint. It's finding products that, that they want or recognizing deals that they may be enticed by, um, things like that. And so I think when it comes to sort of picking apps, you should be focused first on, are we doing something that satisfies these needs for a customer? Can we help them understand more about us, our products, pay for those products, all those kind of things. But at the same time, we still have to worry about the weight of our tech stack on our website as well. You know, we've, like Lindsay said, we've got, um, minute changes in page load time that can be made to increase our revenue by a lot. Uh, and so we have to sort of take all of that into account across the board. And, and our goal may be being that four second mark, but really if we can get to a two second mark, we're really winning, right? And so what we want to do is, you know, in let's say in the Shopify app store, for example, look for apps that say that they don't impact site speed or minimally impact site speed. We also want to measure for ourselves. And so make sure that we're testing in a way that proves that that's true. Um, you know, because it could be that the app itself isn't bothering your site, but the app in use with another app is bothering your site. So we need to make sure that the ecosystem is symbiotic as well um, all along the way. I think some of the other things that um, lead towards satisfaction are like aesthetically pleasing uh, scenarios. And so looking for apps that when they impose UI into your website, that it's customizable or that it looks really good um, that it can be modified in such a way that feels on brand. So it doesn't look like you've bolted a solution onto your website that just sort of doesn't really fit. You know, I think, um, at the end of the day, a cohesive branded experience and a fast experience and one that produces results for a customer, whatever their goal might be easy payment methodology, find the right product, understand the product, um, gain a promotion, whatever it might be has to be timed well, and it has to be effectively used. Uh, I think the other thing that we see merchants go down a rabbit hole on are extraordinarily complex apps. How long does it take to set up? How quickly can you get up and running and prove that it's working for you? Um, is it easy to implement? Is it easy for somebody on your team to take over and utilize as well? Or is it a one person only job and that guy's off today, so we can't make our search work today or something like that. And so you wanna make sure as well that you can understand the app and become, I guess, an internal expert on it as well. And so finding things that have simple interfaces that work well, but in a robust way and that achieve all of your goals are just as important as making them fast and pretty as well. Um, but uh, I think all of those things need to be considered and tested. And like Swad said, do your own research, find the things that work for you, use your data to back it up, make sure that your assumptions are provably true and uh, you know, go for it from there and don't be afraid to change when you need to. 
Right. And each of those incremental changes that you make have a big impact over time. So I think that's really good advice. Thanks, Wes. Moving on to an important topic that can often be overlooked when it comes to conversion. Wes, how can ADA compliance positively impact your conversion rate? And what are some ways to vet the apps in your tech stack for compliance? Well, um, I think the, the statistic that resounds really well with me is that something like 25 of our audience in the United States anyway, or in North America, will at some point in their life suffer a disability that prevents them from consuming information in a certain way. Maybe their hands are not working or they're suffering from hearing loss or vision loss or colorblindness, things like that. And you know, the way I look at it is if we're gonna wipe 25% of our audience off the table right away, that's an enormous amount of revenue that we're sacrificing. Um, not to mention that it saves you from a lawsuit. Uh, you know, oftentimes we see uh, sort of these shark skin suit wearing attorneys traveling around suing websites simply for not being compliant. And so if nothing else, you're avoiding that. Um, but I think realistically too, there's a ton of benefits to being what's called WCAG compliant, which is the equivalence of like ADA compliance on the internet. Um, you know, for one, you open the door to everybody. And so you're not discriminating by accident or by default. Um, you know, which is a, a welcoming thing to do. You obviously want every member of your audience to be available to your, your purchase funnel or whatever. Um, it also variably benefits SEO. It's the tactics used to make a compliant website are also good tactics to use for on-site SEO, uh, for search engine crawls and things like that. I think it, it benefits you quite a bit uh, as well. But um, I think when it comes to sort of judging the apps, really the only way to know is testing. Um, you have to implement it. You have to look at it. You have to use human tools or mechanical tools to understand what it's impacting and make sure that, you know, simple things like color contrast or font size are, are effective. And at the same time, you need to make sure that people who can't use a mouse that use maybe a keyboard to navigate or some other assistive tool can traverse that app and, and sort of find its context or read it back for, through a screen reader or a braille machine or some other sort of assistive technology that, uh, that helps them traverse the website. So, you know, the, the bummer of it all is that, you know, not every app developer is WCAG compliant when it comes to the apps. We don't necessarily have a standard, let's say in the Shopify app store that specifically calls that out. Um, but I do see sort of a sea change happening where all of these app devs know that they have to do this and they're all working really hard to get there. Soon enough in the States, it'll become law. And so there won't be a choice. Uh, and so you might as well get ahead of that curve and, and do the right thing now rather than later. Um, but I think it really comes down to jump off the cliff, install the app, do some quick testing, maybe in a development environment, make sure that it's, it's working in the way that you want um, and uh, you know, go for it if it, uh, if it works out. Yeah, and Steph, any compliance tips you can share from the Just Junior perspective? Yeah, from the Just Juno side, right, our focus is more of the pop-ups on site and then the messaging that we're showing in there. So Just Juno, it does work with screen readers and it allows you to tap through that text or any layer that's in your pop-up to read that back and assist them through that experience if they're leaving. So you still are able to engage with that visitor properly in terms of like anticipating their next step. And I think what, like what you really want to look at with the, with this is from a conversion point, you are becoming better than your competitors. You're allowing that experience to even happen or for, for you to be the go-to for that or for them to always know that, oh, that's possible. You're kind of comparing, allowing yourself to be compared to their other experiences. So I think it puts you in a really good spot to be remembered in that way and to be shared. And as far as the just Uno side, it is easy to implement and make that easy to, to just launch in a pop-up in in any experience that you have on site right and Colleen any insights you can share yeah I actually recently worked with a customer who um, was audited and got some feedback right that their price filter um, was not ADA compliant and so we were easily able to take that from a slider they were a medical equipment company um, so it was a slider price filter and we were able to easily turn that into a list filter and create some appropriate buckets um, on the page that reflected like really good price threshold as it related to their products and so that took something that was really difficult for their customers to utilize and 
and turn it into something really easy without any dollars, right? Very quick, like immediate within seconds, they were able to kind of adjust that experience and also check something off of their list, their audit that they got um, dinged for. So um, being inclusive, making sure that we have products that easily speak to and support our customers in this way is front of mind for search ring and a lot of other amazing companies as it should be. Um, and, and, you know, should definitely be front of mind as we go into evaluating our sites. Lindsay, how does a Kendo approach compliance? Yeah. So our reviews widgets out of the box are compliant. We've done a lot of testing and optimization, um, to make sure that we've built them that way. So again, reinforcing the idea that, you know, we know this is important to our audience, um, but of course, because our widgets are extremely customizable. So going kind of to Wes's point um, on the last question where, you know, making sure your whole brand experience is, you know, the same throughout the website, um, our widgets are extremely customizable so that you can make it, you know, again, not seem like it's just plopped here in my reviews. Um, so we give a lot of flexibility in terms of those font changes and the color contrast and all those things. So out of the box, yes, the widget is um, compliant, but as you are making those branding changes, it's really important to also make sure that whatever changes you are making are compliant as well. Um, so just, you know, kind of being consistent again, you know, making sure, like I said, out of the box, we're thinking about it, but at the end of the day, it's your brand, it's your design, uh, making sure that you guys as, you know, merchants are on top of what you're building or what anyone else is building for you, because at the end of the day, you know, it's your brand on the line. So just making sure, you know, you guys have that buy-in and you feel comfortable with your compliance as well. Definitely. And now rounding it up, we all know personalization is important, but Colleen, how does personalization increase on-site conversion and actually impact your bottom line? Yeah, so this can be huge, y'all. And I know that there's like a lot of buzz around personalization and all of that, but when set up correctly on the site, the the goal right is that we should see that people are spending longer on your site that they're looking at more products that they are converting on more products and therefore i mean we've seen numbers impacting bottom line revenue of, of 20 plus percent right both with the personalized recommendation widgets and these types in these places on your site your home page your 404 your no results um, on your um, PDPs, right? Like making sure they're set up in such a way um, that people see them and that they're recommending like really solid products, but also personalization on the search and listing pages as well, right? So it's tracking that user behavior and it's making these micro elevations on the page um, so that it speaks directly to that shopper's experience on site. Um, so not just, hey, have personalization, but let's put in thought about what type of personalization we can apply, where it should be applied, making sure the data science is there, that we have the ability to manipulate certain widgets on certain pages in certain scenarios when the data science isn't hitting just right. Um, and then some good metrics for evaluating like are they working and where can we tweak and um, how can we, we be really strategic about this? And when all of those things are present, you can really impact the bottom line just by doing what you can to give shoppers exactly what they're looking for there. Jeff, what are your thoughts on personalization? Personalization, I agree with Colleen in that it is like a, a buzzword. It, it does get you thinking in like, how can I personalize? Like, what can I do? And for like pop-ups and targeting on site, my first thought is geolocation and maybe more related to where you are in stores. Like if you're in Costco or if you are just like in the pharmacy on their corner that they can go to, that kind of makes it feel more, more attainable there. And so geolocation can really make that personalization easy to implement because you know like what your regions are and you can base that too just on seasonality. So it can kind of connect to that whole experience that someone like why someone may be visiting. And with personalization, you can truly have that welcome back for a visitor where a visitor without just the just your new experience, maybe they're coming back and they've added items to cart but they're just picking up, they've kind of got to do their research again to get in the mode of wanting to shop. 
So if we're welcoming, welcoming them back in a personalized way, then we're showing them the products in a pop-up of like, hey, you left these in cart. Like, what are you looking for? Asking maybe a discovery question or giving them a sweet offer if they end up bundling that together. So that type of personalization of thinking of a really good offer at the right time for when they arrive allows you to create an actual experience instead of just these kind of one-off interactions of like, oh, hey, I kind of know that brand or kind of remember that shopping there. Um, so you don't want to get confused in the bunch, right? So I think that's where personalization helps you stand out from your competitors as well. Definitely. And Lindsay, what personalization recommendations can you make? Yeah. So kind of that example, like I talked about before, you know, I have dry skin, I'm looking for this. I was able to filter, find people like me that in itself, you know, giving the ability to filter and search and find that's kind of personalizing it for the customer, allowing them to personalize, you know, the reviews results that they have and find the right product. Um, but I think the beauty of reviews and, you know, kind of speaking to what Stephen Colleen said, you know, it's kind of becoming a buzzword personalization. And a lot of brands don't really know where to start or it feels overwhelming. Um, well, all those customer attributes, so the dry skin or the age behavior, all of that, that you're collecting in reviews are actually a really important source of zero party data. Um, that will actually help you power those personalization efforts, you know, not just on site, but in your email communications and, you know, your merchandising strategy and your pop-ups all of that. So, you know, if I now know that, okay, this customer, because they left a review has dry skin, well, let me think of, you know, and they purchased this moisturizer, let me, you know, send them a product recommendation based on something else they can add to their skincare routine. Or, um, you know, we have athletic brands or athleisure brands, you know, that are like asking what activities are you, you know, doing in these leggings that you just purchased? And it'll be things like, um, I'm either a weightlifter or I'm a runner or, you know, all of that information and even just taking that community building aspect, right, for that retention, that lifetime value, that um, continuous uh, customer loyalty. Well, now if I know that you like running, which really didn't have anything to do with the leggings that you purchased, um, but I was able to get that through the review, um, I can now maybe send you emails about like a running event that we're sponsoring nearby or give you content and educational articles about like how you can get started in your running routine. If you're, you know, not sure, like advanced, you know, tips for running a marathon, you know, and how to keep. So it's really like, there's so much you can do with that data to really personalize those experiences. And I think just from the customer attribute side, it's one of those things where like, you think about it as a review, cool, but there's just so much more you can do with that data to really personalize the experience and keep those customers coming back. So especially with the cost of acquisition being really high right now, this is such an easy way to kind of get something that helps on site, you know, as well, but also make sure you're continuing to, to nurture those customers and keep them coming back for more. Right. And then with Okendo survey product, you can yes. now ask questions at any stage within the customer journey, whether it's on site before they made that purchase or at the post purchase, the thank you page after they check out and collect those data points to really fuel that personalization engine. Yep. Exactly. God, any thoughts on personalization from Sezzle's perspective? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Buy now, pay later, it's it's proven to be a sticky solution. Um, I can't speak for other solutions out there, but the top 10% of Sezzle shoppers use the solution over 40 times a year. So that's a really high amount, right? So now, now that you have like access to that data, you should work with your solution um, to further, for instance, personalize your assets on your on your branding. So uh, on your on your on your website branding. So when you have a website banner that says, "Hey, they, you can use Sezzle here," maybe start to include some stats. Maybe you can, um, you know, leverage Sezzle's uh, marketing team to like create items that are, you know, again personalized for your store. So again, there's the solutions are out there to help you. All you have to do is ask. So you have to get in, try and get in touch with the solutions, and then again, personalize assets the widgets, anything that you can to like really make that solution unique to your own store. That, that That's like something that I would say, yeah. All right, and then Wes, I'd love for you to wrap us up. What rec recommendations can you make for personalization? Well, I think the easy recommendation is you have to do something, right? I think um, the, the internet's a place that is no longer just a website with a computer in between you and the website. People are expecting a brick and mortar like experience. They're wanting customer service. They're wanting a humanistic experience. And so something as simple as like 
saying, hello, SWAD, welcome to the website, because we know who you are, um, is a step in the right direction, right? And we need to find unique but interesting methods to make our customers understand that we sort of kind of know who they are, we're trying to serve their best interests, um, you know, and whether that's putting products in their face, I saw a question about, um, is there an importance of using chatbots or AI for conversions? And I, I'm a big fan of AI. I think it works really well. And I think where I tend to start to draw my lines there are, we can use AI to do personalization, but we also need to control those rule sets in such a way. So we need to find something that's both flexible and capable of being manipulated by a human decision maker along the way. I think computers will make great choices most of the time, but we still need to consider that we're selling to humans, not robots. And we need to make sure that we're personalizing for human beings, not for uh, you know a search engine bot or something along the way. And I think, you know, likewise when it comes to search, um, you know, making sure that we're delivering results that matter to the user based on their behaviors can be a form of AI or it can be a form of machine learning or something like that. And so, making sure that we utilize those tools that come out of the box that way um, can be great, but also that we dial in those tools over time to make them sort of refined for our particular audience. But um, I think no matter what, personalization is inevitably going to impact your bottom line, whether it's a half a point or 20 points, uh, it, it really doesn't make a difference. More is always better in this context, I think. And so if you do nothing, you'll gain nothing. And if you do something, you'll always gain something. And I think that's important to keep in mind. And so then it's just a matter of cost benefit analysis, how hard and or simple is it to execute? Does it deliver something that resounds with our audience in a way that, that matters to us as a company? Um, I think the other side of it too that's important to remember is if you're just doing personalization for the sake of personalization, you need to make sure that it's on point with your brand and your values as well. You know, you've got your reputation to uphold and if it just feels robotic or sort of mechanical, um, unless that's an aspect of your brand, it's something to consider when you're building personalization. You need to make sure that it does in fact feel personal. We all know computers are doing these things, but you know, it, it could be as simple as saying, I'm a chat bot, but I'm here to help you answer as many questions as I can. And then we'll transfer you to a human when I run out of info um, or something like that. And so we just need to make sure, um, like I said, that we're doing something and that we're doing some amount of human behavior inside of it as well, just not relying entirely on the machine to do our jobs for us. Definitely. And with that, I would love to thank each of our experts for sharing their insights today. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining. As a reminder, we will be sending out a recording of this panel tomorrow. Hopefully you got some value out of it and we're excited to see you at the next panel. Thank you very much.